I'll tell you, when I was putting together that worship package this week, I was dancing around my office. It was so fun. (laughs) You can't even imagine that of me, can you? (laughs) Well, he is risen. Did you notice that I said, is, not was, Jesus is risen from the dead forevermore, alive and and seated on the throne of heaven. I am a witness to this. But more about that later. You know, Jesus said in Revelation 21, verses 5 and 6, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give the drink without cost from the spring of life. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? Paul Holdcraft tells this story about Michael Faraday, a great chemist. And he was actually voted by the people, as the sign says up there, and discoverer of electromagnetism. One of his... uh, Workmen accidentally knocked a silver cup into a solution of acid. And the cup promptly dissolved. It was eaten up by the fuming liquid. And naturally, the workman, well, he was like terribly disturbed at destroying a beautiful cup. But the chemist came and he put a chemical into the jar of acid. Soon, all that silver precipitated to the bottom. Then Faraday lifted the shapeless mass out of the jar and sent it to the silversmith who restored the cup to its original shape. Now Holdcraft makes this application. You know, if a human genius could do a thing like this, why should we doubt that God's ability to raise the dead? And yet, truth be known, There are even people in Christian circles that do doubt. Some seminaries even teach skepticism when it comes to the resurrection. I guess they kind of figure that it's a story of hope made up when things, you know, went tragically wrong for Jesus. But you know what? It is true. And we have proof. In fact, we have millions. No, strike that. Billions of witnesses of the truth. From the excitement of Palm Sunday to the bitter, cold reality of the cross, you know, this week would be spoken of more than any other event in human history. The people were ready for a Messiah to come and and rid them of their earthly oppressors, those Romans. But it was not to be on their terms. You see, God had planned and orchestrated this event from outside of our time-space continuum. He had told his prophets of old, hundreds, even thousands of years prior, that he had a plan for the restoration of his beloved masterpiece, humankind. You're a masterpiece. Say that with me. I'm a masterpiece. You know, when God made you, he said, It is good. He himself would come and rescue the hopelessly lost from the evil that threatens to permeate everything. Isaiah foretold about this. Actually, you know, it was like some 700 years before Jesus stood in front of his accusers and And, you know, before he was arraigned with Pilate on that week that changed the world, he was oppressed and afflicted, Isaiah said, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. The defining moment, of course, came on Friday as Christ was tortured and and hung on the cross to die. As Pastor Ron said in his message last week, that thin red line 
Jesus' blood was the atonement for our sins, and not only ours, but the sins of the world. A righteous and holy God took upon himself to pay the penalty and purchase our redemption. As Jesus took his last breath on the cross, his body succumbing to the torture, he spoke with finality. It is finished. No longer would your sin and my sin have to separate us from a living relationship with our Creator. Finished. No more sacrifices are necessary for forgiveness. It is finished once and for all time. And then they laid his cold, dead body in the borrowed tomb. The good shepherd had laid down his life for his sheep. All seemed hopeless to his disciples. But the best was yet to come. The tomb is empty. Jesus has risen from the dead. Just as he said he would. Just as the scriptures had proclaimed for over a thousand years. It is true. There is a resurrection from the dead. There is life after death. And there were witnesses. Hundreds of witnesses. Then thousands of witnesses. Then millions of witnesses. But how do we know that the biblical account of the events happening that day so long ago are acceptable proof that Jesus rose from the dead? Think about it. What if the stone was never rolled away? Perhaps Jesus was never even born, never mind lived a righteous life and died a cruel death. You know, some in our world today are proclaiming just that. So how can you know what is true in this matter? What evidence is there of the resurrection? Well, I was thinking about it, and you know, a time machine would be a real handy invention, wouldn't it? I mean, we'd just zip back there and, and look into this historical event that, so far, no such contraption. But there are other historical events that we know are true. How do we know, for example, that the British won against Napoleon at Waterloo? There were no news teams on site, no CNN, no internet video bloggers showing us the deciding blow. Photography, well, it wasn't actually invented until 10 years later. How do we know it's not fake news that the British won? Do we have any British people here? I think we do, hey? Yeah. How do we know? Well, we do know that the British coalition won on June 18th, 1815 at the Battle of Waterloo. But what evidence is necessary to actually come to this conclusion? Perhaps the fact that we're not speaking in French today, as my wife once told me, would be a really great indicator. But what about other historical effects that predate film or other so-called, you know, permanent records? How do we know that they reflect the truth accurately, that they're not false news? Well, there is at least two ways that we know. Multiple eyewitness testimony or, and, of course, change that's accountable to the event itself. Well, what kind of witnesses, then? Well, first, we would have to look for multiple people. Notice I'm emphasizing multiple people, not just one. Multiple people who were living at the time and ask them to recount the events that they had witnessed. For events that happened in the last 80 or so years, I don't think this would be too big of a problem. In fact, there are still a few people who lived uh, during the First World War, if we wanted to find out more about that one, that could still give us eyewitness testimony. Lots from the Second World War still living. 
we can receive that testimony, be it uh, oral or written in arguments for those skeptics who say that there was no Holocaust. Just ask any Jew that lived in Auschwitz during the 40s, and you will hear a pretty accurate account of the events of that day. They're etched in their minds very good. These people we call eyewitnesses. Now, I just finished saying that there were hundreds of witnesses who saw Jesus Christ both before he died and again after he rose. The Gospels are actually those written accounts of the events that happened during Christ's time. They are written from the eyewitness point of view and are therefore legally acceptable evidence. John writes of the of Jesus' first resurrection appearance that morning in John chapter 20, and Bonnie read that to us earlier, where Mary, who had kept that special vigil over the grave, was most distressed that someone had come and, and had carried away the body of Jesus. As she was weeping, Jesus actually came up behind her and asked, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She later told the disciples that she w went on weeping and didn't even look up at first, thinking, oh, it's just the gardener back there. He doesn't know nothing. Then Jesus called her by name, Mary. Suddenly, she recognized that voice. It was unmistakable. It was her teacher, Rabboni, as she called him. She looks up through tear-filled eyes, and immediately she recognized her Savior. There was no doubt in her mind who spoke her name. She was the first eyewitness to report the risen Savior according to the Gospels, but she wasn't the last. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John wrote down this testimony so that, as John puts it in uh, chapter 20, verse 31, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life in him. Now this sort of secondhand testimony, yeah, I guess it could be inadmissible by our court standards today. You know, the lawyers would cry, Oh, no, sorry, that's just hearsay and not admissible into evidence. You know, hold your horses here. Hearsay because the source is simply reporting on what they, what someone else saw, right? That's the definition of it. Therefore, John explains throughout chapter 20 how Jesus appeared to more of his disciples that day. But most importantly, John himself sees the risen Lord. And he writes down this eyewitness account. This is no longer hearsay, but a written affidavit of someone who was actually there and witnessed the event that they are describing in detail. This is actually admissible evidence, even in our courts, just as it was back then. John had much to testify. In fact, I encourage you, read the book of John. It's a wonderful book to read. Read it over and over again. He witnessed Jesus appearing to the ten of the remaining eleven disciples all together at the same time. And again, this is important for us to take note. Lest anyone be, you know, like Scrooge or something and think it was bad pudding that John ate that brought on this vision that he had. No, not only had Jesus appeared to the ten of them, but he also showed them that he was made of muscle and bones and not simply a ghost or spirit. He showed them where the nails had punctured his hands and his feet. Then John testified that on another day, Jesus laid to rest the concerns of yet another skeptical disciple named Thomas, who 
You know, he just refused to believe without touching Jesus himself, he said. And John tells us that Jesus said to Thomas, Reach here your finger. See my hands? Reach here your hand and, 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 and put it in my side. And be not unbelieving, but be believing. To which Thomas answered, in the presence of not only John, but the other nine disciples that were there, my Lord, my God. And the scriptures go on to say, then Jesus told him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen. That would be us, and yet have believed. You see, to begin with, as evidence, we have the eyewitness account from a reliable man named John, who is described elsewhere in the Bible as a prominent person in the community. We also have eyewitness testimony from Matthew and Mark, who, who witnessed the events just described, and, and you know they wrote about them as well, and you can read that in their book. That's three eyewitnesses, which, frankly, Jewish law says is more than enough to condemn a man to death or, frankly, send an innocent man free. It works both ways. Therefore, we would have to say that the evidence provided is valid and binding, but wait, we, we, we don't even have to simply rely on the testimony of these three. I did, after all, say that there were thousands of witnesses and even more. If we left it with that written evidence, we may encounter objections based on, you know, tampering of the evidence because we don't actually have the original signed affidavits or manuscripts. You know, the ones that these men actually wrote in their hand. We don't have those anymore. But we do have very reliable copies. But, you know, it could leave room for an objection based on scribal error or deliberate tampering. Eh, some these days say, ah, oh, it's just fake news. So our second way of determining whether history is accurately reflected can be found in lasting changes brought about because of what happened that Easter morning. Kind of like what Linda meant when she said, we don't all speak French, you know? How has the resurrection of Christ affected the history of the world? Well, think about it. You know, within 30 years of the main event, a man named Paul, bound in chains before King Agrippa, gave this account. It was about noon, O king, as I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Arabic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Paul, referring to this initial encounter, later wrote, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. The Old Testament prophecy predicted it, and, and those written records of Actual events declared it, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, Jonah and other prophetic Old Testament passages, again, directly spoke of these events that would take place. And then Matthew and Mark and Luke and John testified and fulfilled of the fulfillment of this in Jesus Christ. Then it goes on to say, and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at one time. 
of whom the greater part remain until this present. They were still alive in Paul's day, thus presenting eyewitness testimony to Paul himself. But some have fallen asleep. As expected, some had died prior to the time Paul wrote down this passage. After that, Paul goes on to say that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. Well, you know, the fact that more than 500 witnessed the risen Lord in one day, and the fact that they continue to testify about that some 30 years later. I mean, just, just think about that for a moment. 30 years later, they are testifying to the resurrection, even into Paul's day, meaning you have this great body of evidence that is building. For Paul, there was no question that Jesus rose on the third day. He preached it everywhere he went. He believed it. You know, it was in him. And he accepted it. And he accepted that that same resurrection power that would rise Christ from the dead would one day also resurrect him. But that's just, again, you know, it's like one man out of history. And I did say there were thousands that witnessed Christ's resurrection. In fact, there is plenty of evidence of changed lives. You know, if you have your Bibles along, you could turn with me to Acts chapter 4, and, and there you would read, while Peter and John were addressing the people, the priests and the chief of the temple police, some Sadducees came up indignant that these upstart apostles were instructing people and proclaiming that the resurrection from the dead had taken place in Jesus. They arrested them and they threw them in jail until the morning. For by now it was already late in the evening. But many of those who listened had already believed the message. In round numbers, about 5,000 of them. With 5,000 people hearing the message of new life in Christ, we now have several thousand witnesses to the fact that the resurrection took place. But a few thousand people changed lives. Maybe that still won't persuade you somehow to believe that Christ arose. Well, you know, within the first hundred years, historians record that close to a million lives had been influenced by the resurrection of Christ. Many laying down their lives are receiving horrific treatment at the hands of those who haven't yet met our Lord and Savior. Think about that, you know. I think people will go to great lengths to defend and protect an idea, but few are willing to die for it. Yet over the centuries, millions have given their lives in service of the Lord changed by the risen Christ forever. And today's actual current estimate of those who call themselves Christians are, you know, plus or minus two billion who have come to know the risen Christ. From the testimony of one lady named Mary to two billion people who call themselves Christians proclaiming Jesus Christ is risen indeed, well, this surely makes a case for changes directly accountable by the event. But that's just numbers, right? People today are affected by the risen Christ in so many ways. From eternal life to resurrected marriages and renewed relationships, not to mention the assurance and, and the peace that comes from knowing your Creator, knowing that He actually cares for you, loves you. Well, that brings me to my last point. So what if Jesus did rise? What does it prove? And what should our response be? 
The power of the resurrection actually answers one of life's most difficult questions. I think we've all asked it a time or two. Is there really life after death, or is this it? With Christ's return from the grave, the answer is an overwhelming yes. <laughs> no longer would we have to bury our dead with no hope in seeing them again. No longer would we happen, you know, would what happens to us on on this earth be the end of the matter. Our life becomes the beginning of a long trek into eternity. With some spending an eternity with Christ himself and others choosing to be eternally separated from God. Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And where shall he live? Well, Jesus told us that too, right? In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go there to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so we can be there forever. The good news of the resurrection is that We are more than just pounds of chemicals held together by gravity and skin. And this news has changed the entire world ever since. He not only made himself known to thousands years ago, but he lives here today. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, lived a righteous life, died a cruel death on the cross, was buried dead and wrapped in grave clothes, but he didn't stay dead. The earth could not hold him in that grave. The power of God rolled back that stone, not so that Jesus could get out, but so that we could get in. God moved that stone so that people would know for certain that Jesus was no longer dead. He is alive. We have testimony from eyewitnesses who saw him the very day that he rose. We have more witnesses, well over 500 of them, who were still alive 30 years later when Paul came on the scene. And we have Paul's testimony that he saw the risen Lord on that road to Damascus and that encounter actually changed his life forever. We have 5,000 Change lives in one day. Oh, Lord, we'd love to see that again. 3,000 in another, as, as Peter and John told in their testimonies of the resurrection and its power. We have millions who have found that power that raised Christ from the dead changed their lives for eternity. Every day, every minute, There have been several of them go by since I started. Somewhere in the world, another life is touched by the risen Christ and the power of the resurrection continues to prove its own case. We don't even have to prove it. Every day, people throughout the world pray and receive Jesus Christ as their risen Savior. Every day. The evidence is in. You need to reach a verdict. You need to make a decision. Did Jesus rise from the dead or not? If so, is Jesus Christ your risen Savior? Will you worship our risen King? That's what the disciples did the moment they realized it was true. Matthew said they worshipped him. Perhaps you've not made that decision yet. Well, today would actually be a real good day to do so. Trust me, you want to do it sooner rather than later. The Bible says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Well, how do you know if you've heard his voice? Well, if inside you, you heard that little voice say, no, pastor, Jesus Christ is not my risen Savior. 
Or, no, I have not prayed to him to receive him. Well, today you have actually heard his voice. He's telling you. Today is your day of salvation. Do not harden your heart, but pray this prayer in, the, in your heart along with me. And it's actually between you and the Lord. So let's spend a moment and pray. Jesus Christ, as I think about your sacrifice, you took my sins upon yourself. Thank you for freeing me from the punishment due my sins. I repent of my sins. And this day, I take my stand to be numbered among those who believe in you. I accept your costly gift. And I ask you to be Lord of my life. So that I too can experience your resurrection. Fill me. Yes, fill me, Lord, with that resurrection power through your mighty Holy Spirit and make my life anew so that I too can come and worship our risen King. Amen. You know, maybe you weren't quite ready to pray that prayer yet, especially those who are on the internet and you're probably going to see this in a few days up on screen for you anytime and it doesn't even need to be that complicated to say Lord help me have mercy and he'll come let's pray Lord Jesus I ask you to fill us once again with your resurrection power that we might go from here this day knowing that we serve you our risen Savior for those of you who may have chosen to make that decision today, oh, thank you, Lord. I can't wait to meet my brothers and sisters when I get to heaven. I know every time that you've asked me to include that in my message that you've planned it for someone, and I can't hardly wait. Lord, rise them up. Fill them and draw them into your church so that they will begin to grow in the grace and, and in the knowledge of who you are and begin to experience that power of your love. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. You guys have a great Easter Sunday. I hope it's filled with lots of chocolate. God bless you.